Okay, well, thank you. Um, should I stand up? I sort of feel like I should. Stand up. Okay, I'll stand up. Um, <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, it's a special occasion for me because uh, this book, as Manny mentioned, is um, there we go. Is about five years worth of my life. Uh, sort of PhD is a very arduous experience. <coughs> But in many ways, it's actually much more than that. Uh, it's uh, since I first came to Palestine in 1997, I was exposed. I, I worked in so many different uh, spheres, whether it was the grassroots NGOs, INGOs, even the government, and uh, that exposure to that world and the drastic transformations that I've seen taking place throughout Palestine since 1997. I thought there was a real need to try and capture that somehow, to somehow relate it back to more critical uh, global debates about what's going on in the world when it comes to specifics of development or state building or peace building. I also felt, felt it was necessary to try and relate things back to uh, theory because, uh, uh, because a lot of what, what happens here and in general when we talk about development, it, it doesn't fall from the sky. There are theoretical underpinnings that inform and irrigate the policies that are derived, there are interests, there is power, and these things need to be captured. And I really feel, I felt, as somebody who was very much involved in research and writing, following journalism and, 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 uh, and, and different kinds of reports that were coming out, that the story was not getting out there. Parts of it were getting out there, but a lot of, I don't need to go into the reasons why the story wasn't getting out there, wasn't the reasons fully behind that, but I felt there was a need to try and capture it somehow, to unpackage uh, uh, how elements of neoliberal politics and ideas and, and, and these theoretical and global debates around these questions somehow filtered into the question of Palestine. At the same time, there were also some very quite important uh, documents that came out that nobody actually really tried to integrate into their research. When we talk about the Palestine Papers, or WikiLeaks, or other, the World Bank, by, in and of itself, in 2010, uh, disclosed all of its archival research material, saying that they wanted to have a sort of an open access information policy. And I wanted to be able to sort of go back and uh, ground uh, the, my research in some, some of those, that material. Now, when we talk about neoliberalism, a lot of people think that we're talking about the fact that there's a Kentucky Fried Chicken in Ramallah, or the fact that we just opened a, a Coca-Cola factory in Gaza, or the fact that uh, uh, NGOs are so prolific. Uh, of course, uh, neoliberalization is part, uh, part of those, those elements are, do certainly relate to neoliberalization, but we're talking about something much more fundamental, I think, in the Palestinian case, and in general. Uh, we're talking about a paradigmatic shift in regards to how governments relate to citizens, the role of the state, the degree to which states are protectionist, for certain productive sectors, uh, whether it's industry or agriculture, uh, uh, who owns things, how, how, uh, whether there's free trade, the role of the government in protecting certain communities, uh, and, and are they out there actually funding sectors or, or not? Uh, or are they taking them away and allowing for things like privatization to take place? So, um, uh, now, of course, neoliberalism has gotten a bad rap lately, and I think for, for, for good reasons. Ever since 2007 and the financial collapse of much of uh, the global economy, and now the blowback that is taking place in places like the United States and Europe, and that has been taking place for the last 10 years, we, uh, the, the politics of neoliberalism have been under critique. Now, obviously, at the same time, neoliberalism is not just a, hasn't just been one set of policies. It itself has evolved over time. But even with that said, uh, the, uh, the critiques that have come to, uh, uh, regarding neoliberalism uh, in, in domestic spheres, in, in, let's say, in Greece or in, uh, in, in the US, those have not actually penetrated the ideas of how uh, foreign donors have uh, interacted and brought neoliberalism in their development policies, or in their peace building policies, or in their state building policies. And I think it's actually really important to do that. Now, firstly, it's important to sort of caveat by saying it's not just donors who are bringing in neoliberal politics into Palestine. Okay, you have at least three sets of 
uh, uh, sort of uh, sources where neoliberal politics are coming in, whether it's donors and the diversity of approaches that exist within the donor community. You have, of course, Israel, which has been undergoing its own processes of neoliberalization. And then you have a whole sector, the Palestinian uh, political class, that uh, incorporates neoliberal ideas into their vision of state building and national liberation. So, uh, but of course, at the same time, the, the, the degree of power and politics that each one of these has is quite different. And uh, that's why, in my research, I, I tried to look quite squarely at the question of what donors were doing here, because they had a particular powerful role, and I don't think people actually realize how powerful that role is. I mean, years ago, when the Seattle protests took place, there was, was critiques of, of the World Bank and things like what they were doing, but people don't realize that it, in the world, the world Bank in Palestine, the mandate that was given, the, according to their descriptions of the mandate that the World Bank had in Palestine, that it was serving a role more central than in any other major post-conflict situation before or since. That's a quotation from 2003. Two weeks after the Oslo Accords took place, you also had the World Bank publish a six-volume study called Investing in Peace. They had fully worked out, in their opinion, large aspects of what they thought were supposed to happen here and how they were supposed to happen. Um, in fact, one of the, the first interviews that I did for my PhD research was to interview uh, Nabil Shak, who was one of the basically Minister of Development like, uh, for, for almost 10 years. And he said, my first priority was to get the World Bank out. They had been given our economy to them, and we didn't have any space. And I found that to be quite uh, interesting, even counterintuitive to some of the critical approaches that I'd heard about, it, as though the Palestinian Authority was just somehow doing donor bidding and World Bank, because there is that kind of criti critical line that ex exists out there. Even more than that, the World Bank itself actually had a mandate uh, that the, the, the politics that it developed, and the policies that it developed, didn't just stick in Palestine, they became formative in developing World Bank policies outside of Palestine. So whether it's in East Timor, or whether it's in uh, Afghanistan or Iraq, a lot of the peace building and state building and stuff came, according to the own World Bank's own acknowledgement, came from the Palestinian uh, policy setting. So it gives you a sense of how important. Similarly, the, uh, the IMF was also given a large manner, and its, its thumbprint or fingerprint or shoe print, shall we say, is very noticeable in Palestine. In fact, according to their own, their own writings again, they say the reforms carried out by the IMF in the Palestinian setting were among the most far-reaching of those implemented in the Middle East and North Africa during the last decade. That's from 2012. So uh, basically, they had enormous mandate and policy space and, and action. Now, okay, it's not... Not, not everything is what, what they say and what, what they did, of course. And the reality that emerged was not from some omni-powerful, posi omnipotent position that they had. But certainly we can say we didn't get peace from their peace-building measures and we didn't get state, a state from their state-building measures. We got, in my opinion, sort of, which is sort of the, the end conclusion of this, to start from the back, we got what I describe as some kind of Palestine Limited. LTD stands for Limited. Okay, and the understanding of Palestine Limited was, was a double sense. Limited in the sense that we had the creation of this thing called Palestine that was a diminutive form of what we as Palestinians, or et many people who had a larger historical understanding of what the Palestinian struggle and cause, that didn't resemble at all the historical understanding of what we had of Palestine. It was also a nomenclatural distinction that was created out of the Oslo process. The fact that we have uh, .ps in our internet, or 970 as our telephone code, giving, or the fact that we are uh, non-member observer states in the United Nations. But in truth, we are, we are, we, it, this represents nothing similar to some form of, uh, of a real state with real sovereignty. And even those nomenclatural distinctions most of the time have to go through some form of Israeli control. So uh, how do we? Uh, so that's all, that's one side of the Palestine Limited. The other side of the Palestinian Limited was a very deliberate intent idea to say that the reality that emerged in the OPT was some variant of an institutional arrangement that resembled some kind of uh, 
holding company. Palestine is a holding company with different forms of investors invested in the reality that was created here. Uh, and they were reaping some forms of dividends. Now, some of these dividends were economic, but other of them were service-related or political or security-related. And so, that was, so that's the title. Now, I, I'm not really interested in like holding to pure loyalty to this sort of cl clever title of Palestine Limited. Obviously, the reality of the merge of Palestine and what's happened here over 20 years plus is, is a very complicated affair. And I don't have time to go through it, but there is a need to try and figure out how we went from these, this big intention and this big mandate uh, to this reality in the end that we have, that we find ourselves today. And now, if you want the full story, obviously, my, my intention was to try and write a lot of that story in, in the book. What I'll speak about today are the four, four, four basic stages of that story that I think um, are counterintuitive to, to how people have often thought about what happens here. And the, 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 first, the first stage... <laughs> um, the, the, the first, stage of it, first stage of it is, of course, the planning stage of it, which nobody talks about. Well-intended well plans oftentimes don't actually show themselves, reveal themselves in the daily reality. But one of the things I was able... And one of the most shocking things I was able to find in my research was actually the existence of a degree of premeditation around what happened here. Now, what do I mean? I mean, very specifically, that the American government used forms of game theory and political economy analysis to try and predetermine what would, how they could predetermine the winners and losers of the interim phase of the Oslo plan from 93 to what ended up being 2000. And in fact, this, this, the, you know, a lot of people can say what happened in Oslo, you know, it was unpredictable, or there was the rapine assassinations and this, and this suicide bombing, but there was actually a lot of planning that took place previously, and this game theory, uh, use of game theory by the Americans to try and determine who would win, and ironically, the results of that game theory uh, were shockingly similar. They picked scenarios that, in their understanding, would lead to Israel and Jordan being the political and institutional winners of the interim period, and that these would lead to, have the potential to lead to civil war and to, uh, to reignition of the Intifada. This is from a document from May 1993, Basically, at the exact same time, when the Oslo Accords are happening in Oslo, and the Americans are getting daily updated as to the progress of what's happening. This is, if you read the, the bio, biographical accounts of many of the people who were involved in, in this, we know it was happening. The back room of Oslo was actually being daily updated but with the American embassy. Then you have... the. And at the same time, they're game theory and seeing how they, once they knew the concessions that the Palestinians were giving, they found ways to try and predetermine who would win. And they picked the least democratic scenario to take place, and that Israel and Jordan would be the winners of this. And, and later on, we see the re-eruption of the Intifada taking place. We do see a form of a civil war coming, developing. So, not to prescribe full linearity, but certainly, in, to find disclosure of a sense of like a real sense of planning on behalf of the big guys and the big guys that matter, okay, the United States who was actually controlling the political process of what was going on here. Then of course you have the peace building stage. Now peace building, peace building was uh, was incorporated as an independent track to the Oslo process. And uh, it was in one of the annexes of the Oslo process itself, uh, where major local and regional developmental programs were intended to be activated with a self-described Marshall Plan understanding of the peace process. Okay, so basically they had, uh, they were trying to encourage international investment, to encourage local, regional, and inter-regional trade, feasibility studies for free trade zones, etc. This was the neoliberal sort of NAFTA type initial understanding plan of the Oslo, of, of the, and it was very, uh, 
reflective of that sort of NAFTA type approach at, at the time. Uh, with hello, hello, hello. Okay. Uh, so, with the intention that uh, this na uh, these these uh, so these big huge Marshall plans were trying to create opportunities, economic opportunities fundamentally, that fit into a vision for sustaining uh, the peace process. Now, uh, before I get into the details of the things, I just want to go through the, there's, so we had planning, we had peace building, then we had a major reform period, the year, period 2000 to 2004, this is the period when we had, as I described, the IMF said we had the most comprehensive reforms in the entire Middle East, to take place, and then of course we had a state building phase to take place, uh, where, where, where supposedly the institutions of a Palestinian state were, were, were being created. And in fact, in 2012, the IMF gave a stamp of approval saying that we actually have official state building. Now, of course, we didn't get the state. Now, before we go into the details of each one of these things, I've gone into planning, I'm not really actually gonna say much more about it, but there was a sense of continuity that united the approach of all these phases, and it remains today as a salient framework of how a lot of the donors go out and approach their, their work today. And I think it's captured by uh, a quotation by uh, Nigel Roberts, who was the World Bank country director today, who in 20, uh, uh, so for, for many years here, excuse me, and in 2005 he said the following, he said, a strong Palestinian economy delivering growth and above all jobs is a vital part of a beneficial political process. Whereas I think that one cannot say that economic growth and economic vitality are of themselves enough to produce a benign political process, one can, however, I think, say the opposite, which is that economic desperation, high unemployment, high poverty levels, lack of economic dynamism, are certainly a fairly good guarantee for social instability, and a lack of resolution of these deep-set political issues. In other words, Palestinian economic vitality is a vital component of any peace process. So, this, you hear it all over the place, both in Palestine and, and around the world, but it, the, the, it does not come from, uh, uh, so, the, comes from a certain set of logic, okay? Donors' interventions were, were designed to enhance the possibility for economic development, facilitate private sector-led growth, generate employment, raise the GDP, unleashing some form of peaceful impetus that would lead to a peace dividend, what they call the peace dividend, and some form of trickle-down economics a la peace dividend would lead through some, based upon the pre-assumption that other rational, self-maximizing individuals would lead to, lead to peace. This would actually, actually would, could sustain. Even if the, thing, the issues were political, these could do a great uh, service to uh, mitigating uh, 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 the potential for the conflict to return to, 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 to violent conflict. Now, this, these sets of this larger fundamental neoliberal idea, because this is how you see how it goes, it fundamentally became an argument for private sector-led growth in a context like Palestine, okay, and that this would uh, activate uh, peace building and today state building, it still incorporates a strong ingredient of private sector-led growth. But it was based upon ideas that were salient at the time and that were theorized by the World Bank, by uh, one of the heads of uh, research there named Paul Collier, who basically, in the post-Cold War era, came up with what's called the greed theory of, 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 uh, uh, of, of conflict. Now, uh, there, there, are, there are many debates about what causes conflict, but basically he analyzed over 110 different case studies of conflict that were in the post-Cold War era, which were known as intrastate wars. And he, he economically modeled them using econometric analysis and basically said grievance, political grievance, eh, it's really much more about greed. It's really about the economic opportunities of conflict and, uh, and this, is what, this is why the answer to it is creating incentives, uh, changing the incentives around conflict so that we can get peace out of it. 
And uh, so, the, so conflicts, it, it, conflicts are far more likely to be caused by economic opportunities than by grievance. That's an actual quotation by Collier. And the answer to it is to have governance templates, trade preferences, strategies which squeeze the finances of rebel groups, and military interventions, which somehow could be put together to sort of cook together uh, the possibility for peace. Central to the argument, of course, was, was private sector-led growth. And, and, and that this could be the dynamo for promoting peace. And that would what would create the peace dividend. Now, uh, of course, there's a lot, a lot has happened to them, but in truth, this was a big lie. It was a big lie, and in the most important elements of it, they understood it was a lie. But in the Palestinian context, it was particular. Uh, because they, they thought that with a series of technical and economic fixes, they could somehow make invisible the very sticky political problems that existed here. Uh, and we, uh, a large part of what I, I look at in the book is trying to break down why this was a lie. Uh, now, because it, it was not the, the theoretical the basis of, uh, of these ideas did not play out in reality, and there was a lot of inbuilt in contradiction that the donors themselves actually knew about. So, uh, one of the contradictions to the peace building uh, formula was that this was of course not a post-conflict setting. These ideas were for post-conflict settings, and this was not a post-conflict setting. The Oslo Accords put, kicked the most important political questions to final status. So the, the interim period, where all this peace building and economic opportunities, blah, 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 was, was, was taking place in an unresolved conflict, okay? This gave them a kind of sense that they were part of uh, gerrymandering or biasing the interests that were being promoted in the interim period by these things for influencing the future outcomes. Okay? What I mean is, fundamentally, basically, the prioritization of Israeli security over Palestinian security in the interim period, donor silence over Israeli settlement expansion, uh, their acceptance of a secretly negotiated deal to begin with, their privileging of a, a preferred partnership with the Fatah party, their preference for big international, uh, uh, big um, uh, expatriate capitalists at the expense of the majority, 95% of the Palestinian actors being small and medium economic actors, plans to reduce refugee entitlement, all these forms of activity, inactivity, and bias by donors and international finance institutions in the OPT during the Oslo Accords, carried out between the man beneath the mantle of peace building, were effectively read as attempts to prepare the ground or stack the deck in favor of certain positions with respect to final status negotiations. In effect, by Palestinians, they were read as the international equivalent of what Israel was doing. Before negotiations, putting chips on the table, on the ground, that would predetermine the status of certain areas. In the economic and in the social sphere, those plans were seen as attempting to predetermine and privilege certain groups, interests, and sets of politics. Okay? So, uh, 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 so that, that was one set of contradictions. The second problem, of course, with, with the peace building model and the way donors approached it was that they, they ignored the fact that the Oslo Accords were not linked to and contained no independent enforceable arbitration mechanisms that would link these negotiations to international law. You can find a couple of different references in the Oslo Accords to UN Resolution 242. Maybe one or two, I mean, they're very limited. But enforceable arbitration mechanisms is a different story. There was no direct link guaranteeing that the accords would be implemented on, on this. So we had this sort of formalistic that the peace process negotiations, but in reality, when the Palestinians had a problem, it went straight to the power asymmetry between the two. To which donors said, oh, we don't have any, any claim or any stake. And in fact, they had many claims and many stakes and were actually very deeply involved in supporting Israel in certain ways and Palestinians in other ways. Okay? 
And in fact, the ridiculousness of the scenario is even captured by Shimon Peres himself, who, when he discussed later on the issue of the Paris Protocol, basically said, we are not negotiating with the Palestinians, we're negotiating with ourselves. Because it was a question amongst the Israelis about what they were to give up or what not to. And this you can find in every, almost every form of the negotiations around water, around economics, around the politics. It was an internal Israeli question. The Palestinians were, 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 had very limited means to change the situation. The only arbitration that existed was to kick to, kick to the Americans who were, who were backing the Israelis uh, clearly on, 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 uh, as their main strategic ally in, in the accords, in, in, in the process. Now, the third clearly important issue is the fact that the PLO lacked any financial resources of its own. Okay? Oslo was signed two months before the PLO went completely bankrupt. Okay? Till today, more than two-thirds of Palestinian revenues come from sources that are controlled by international donors or the Israelis. This was a, a, a key issue uh, because obviously it showed that the Palestinians were very powerless to change their, their position and it gave the role of the Israelis and the donors huge power of leverage over controlling what they did, including in economic spheres. Now the irony of this is because if you kick this back to their theory of peace building and, 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 and economic uh, revitalization and growth, it actually meant that, that, uh, that the Israelis and the, and the donors had the first say on, on what would or wouldn't go. So if you look at neoliberalism in its pure theoretical format in terms of structural adjustment programs and the Washington Consensus, which I don't know if you know, but basically John Williamson, who, uh, who was at the World Bank, described 10 major policy things that, that basically came to be known as the Washington Consensus. And they are you know, free trade and, and, and austerity programs and budget, uh, 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 floating exchange rates, 10 different major policy things that every government should be doing to try and create economic growth. Five of the 10 key policy uh, uh, tools of the, of the Washington uh, consensus were entirely outside of Palestinian control. Three more, privatization, competition, and property rights, were also seen to be inhibited because of Israeli potential to intervene on them. The Palestinians only had two of the ten major neoliberal policy tools at their ability to control, because they didn't control monetary policy, they didn't control trade policy. So it, it was kind of a joke to speak of a form of neoliberal economic development when Palestinians didn't even control most of the, the tools at their disposal to be able to implement them. So there was a kind of a willful blindness on behalf of donors to actually go along with the theater that this was actually the Palestinians really had economic opportunities before them. Now, uh, of course, when it comes, the central mechanism of neoliberalism is, is, is the private sector and markets. But what kind of markets do we have in Palestine? I mean, all the neoclassical understanding, which economic understandings, which form the basis of neoliberal economics, the majority of it, based on this perfectly operating market conditions, which you don't have at all in Palestine, in any respect. You had closure, and you didn't just have closure from the mid-90s, you had closure from the early 90s, okay? That means the mar there was no market. There was a predetermined set of understandings of who would open and close in a closure regime and who would benefit and who would not benefit. So, and if you're a capitalist, and if your model of development and of peace building is around capitalism, then you would stay the hell away from Palestine because closure has nothing to do with free, free, free movement of goods and people and uh, predictability, which capitalism needs and which economic, uh, you know, uh, whatever, benefit supposedly needs. That's just talking about the market side of things. That we also can't be blind to, or to ignore the fact that Israel had preset economic understandings of the way it was approaching the Palestinians. It was not uh, willy-nilly what was happening. 
the, if you look at Sarah Roy, who was the preeminent economist on development in, of the OPT, she describes the situation of the Palestinian territories as one of de-development. Not underdevelopment, de-development. Which means there's a political incentive to break down the possibility of development taking place. Uh, she describes it as the negation of rational structural transformation, integration, and synthesis where economic relations and linkage systems become and then remain unassembled and disparate, thereby obviating any organic, congruous, and logical arrangement of the economy or of its constituent parts. That's what Israel had been doing to the OPT. So there was no nucleus of some Palestinian economy that was being created. It was a dismembered economy. And then you had closure. So the, the myth of free market capitalism or peace building being able to be created here was, was precisely that, a myth. Fourth, you had, in addition to the economic incentive, uh, economic Israeli uh, ideas around uh, uh, what they were doing with the OPG, they had clear political objectives and policies vis-a-vis -vis the occupied territories. And this, I mean, has a long history to it since 1967, but in a nutshell, in 1967, the Israelis came and they occupied the occupied territories. There were one million Palestinians in these lands. They did not flee. The, they, they, they remained in place because of the historical memory of 1948. The Israelis were in a predicament. What do we do? If we give these people the citizenship, it will erode the Jewish character of the state, if we don't give them citizenship, it will erode the democratic character of our state. So the plan that was conceived that we need some form of autonomy or self-governance, some third party that would be able to play this intermediary role, but this intermediary role could not be the basis for, for, for the nucleus, economic or political, of a new state. Okay. Now the Alon plan, which we, this, which I just described, came out about a month after the occupation in '67 came out. But pretty much all Israeli governments have adhered to the basic idea and outlines of what the Alon plan was, which was we take from these areas what we want, we integrate 1967 and 1948 conquests, we take the water, we take the, the precious land, we take strategic mountaintops, we take key things ideologically for Zionism or whatever. But the people, we have to find this sort of intermediary solution. So at the same, so what I'm arguing here is fundamentally that donors, and whether it was willful or not willful, but were blind to the fact that there was an ongoing Israeli interest and plan for some an autonomy scenario to be created. Okay, the initial plan was for Jordan to for Jordan to play that role. But even Alon himself had conceived the possibility of the PLO playing this role of, an, of, of, of autonomy, basically. Now, mind you, accepting autonomy was considered extremely politically controversial for Palestinians and even treasonous. It was only under the conditions of extreme weakness of 1993, of the existential dangers that the PLO faced, where they were forced to accept autonomy self-governance under continued occupation, and moreover, accept no guarantees that settlement expansion would not continue. And those were two huge concessions that PLO had to accept when it came to Oslo, and that's why it necessarily had to happen in an undemocratic way. They enforced the internalization of the submission on these key political issues in Oslo, not at Madrid. In Madrid, the, the, the negotiation team stood firm on these issues. That's why they created the back channel, and they knew about the finances, and they knew what they, that's why the planning aspect comes out. Now, uh, so Oslo, Oslo, for very much, for the Israelis, was an opportunity for the Israelis to actually actualize this plan. They saw very clearly that this was part, they could realize this. And uh, they very much, since then, have, have gone forward. Now, um, a fifth contradiction to the issue is, is the fact that, of course, the Israeli-Palestinian context was not a context of civil war or interest rate war. A lot of the theories or models that they developed were on this idea that how can we stop 
these wars from continuing. But the case of the Palestinians and the Israelis was not one of intrastate war. It was one of protracted occupation and settler colonialism. Despite that, donors almost exclusively exerted their energies, their resources, their technical expertise in focusing on the Palestinians and almost did nothing to expend, they expended no resources or efforts on the ideological, organizational, institutional, or economic factors which helped perpetuate or sustain occupation or settler colonialism. So they were only dealing with one side of the question as though it was some sort of en endogenous internal problem to Palestinians, and then how could you, it took on the character of attempting to reverse engineer a social and a political and an economic reality. What happened here? Hello? Uh, to, to, to be able to... It's still there? You hear? Yeah? Okay. To, to be able to come, come up with that. Now, uh, another huge problem... It's still there, yeah? Okay. Another huge problem of, of this whole issue... There it is. Because yeah. uh, I can tell when that echo is there. Uh, is the fact that all, again, as I said, uh, there was a, the, the assumption of some kind of pure market. The th it was all based on a theory that there was some sort of the private sector and the market would play, would play a key role. But because of all these things I disclosed, which, which showed that it had nothing to do with uh, uh, an, uh, a, market, a perfect market or operating conditions, you actually had the, the Palestinian context became a particularly distorted and deformed case study of polit what, what uh, political economist Jaber Ashkai describes as politically determined capital, which is found across the Arab world in many places. But in Palestine, it's much, much worse. He describes the context of politically determined capital as follows. The absence of any rule of law in virtually all Arab countries fetters the development of the type of capitalism led by entrepreneurs willing to take risks of the sort implied by investment in fixed capital with long-term amortization. In contrast, speculative or commercial capitalism motivated by the pursuit of short-term profit thrives under such conditions. Such capitalism coexists and often combines with the state's bourgeoisie and becomes politically determined capitalism. Okay? So you can actually, most developmental contexts in the Arab world are some variant of this. But here it's much, much worse because you don't have law at all. You have the Israelis who determine what they want. And then even if the Palestinians have the best laws on their books, it doesn't mean anything because they, it's unenforceable. So the kind of de capitalist development doesn't go into anything that's permanent or predictable or long-term or value-added or profit. It goes into fast money, quick, okay? And this is what donors were actually sponsoring with their neoliberal developmental uh, economic models and, and peace-building models. It comes to the absurd situation where on the year where Israel bombed the Gaza electricity generator, that company made 7% profit. It's true. It's, it's an absurdity. You know? And it comes in, we find it in, 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 not only in the Gaza generator, you find it in the industrial zone generation where very valuable land was given for $1 rent. You have extensive bribery of Israeli and Palestinian government officials to ensure this is the kind of capitalism that emerged. Okay? Now, so, what do we, how do we, how do we, this is all a lot of quite dodgy stuff, as we say in England. Like, and, you know, it's quite implicating, I would argue, for, for what was really going on. Now, that's just looking sort of objectively at some of the aspects of peace building that, that happened. But if we look a little deeper into the story, we also know other aspects of it. The fact that the Oslo Accords had a heavy concentration on the issue of securitization, ensuring Israeli security. And you have that famous quotation of Yitzhak Rabin less than a week before the Oslo Accords were signed, where he says the Palestinians will be at it better at it than we are. And he means ensuring Israeli security. They can, they can do it without going to the Supreme Court and without going to Beit Salem. Without Beit Salem, okay? Meaning, this was supposed to be 
a uh, outsourcing of Israeli security efforts, okay? So it, it, it's well known, this is well discussed. It's a, only part of the story, but it's a very important quotation because it begins to say, okay, so what's going on here? This is a lot more than, this is some form of policing arrangement. In fact, two-thirds of the Oslo Accords were just focused on the security dimension. It's well known. A more problematic quotation than the well-known Rabin quotation is a quotation by Martin Indyk, who was the United States ambassador, who in 2003, when he was being interviewed by CBS News in the middle of basically the Intifada, 2003, he says the Israelis came to us describing the Oslo Accords themselves when they were happening. He says the Israelis came to us and said basically, Arafat's job is to clean up Gaza. It's going to be a difficult job. He needs walking around money because the assumption was he would use it to get control of all these terrorists who'd been operating in these, era, these areas for decades. Okay, that's a quote, direct quotation from Martin and the United States ambassador. Okay. okay, so that doesn't only prove that there was obviously a heavy security component to think. What's much more significant to it is that this arrangement was to rely on off budget accounting. Okay? They allowed for Arafat to create certain forms of monopolies, certain forms of control of the Palestinian economy that was conscious. The Israelis put, them, put the money directly in Arafat's bank account in Tel Aviv. The IMF knows this. And then the, and, and, and the, he was supposed to go around and clean up Gaza with it. Buy big, big, strong men and clean up Gaza. That was, that was the logic of it, okay? Like, and, and he did that. He did that. He bought up the basic basis of, you know, the Fetah movement in Gaza and the West Bank to be his strong arms on the ground. That's what he was asked to do. Now, uh, so, all of this is to bring the conclusion that from beforehand, the arrangement was all planned to be illiberal, both politically and economically. It was not a democratic or liberal peace arrangement where we're supposed to have democracy and free market capitalism, which was how they were claiming, donors were claiming this entire thing was. It was actually intended to be the exact opposite. That it was supposed to be illiberal politically and illiberal economically. So, now, of course, this situation exploded. It, and it led to uh, Camp David, the failed Camp David negotiations, and then the eruption of the uh, Second Intifada, or Al-Aqsa Intifada. Donors had the opportunity at that moment to reconsider, to say, look, maybe we could be more fair, maybe we could do things in a different way. They doubled down. They doubled down on what they were doing. And they said, actually, the problem now is the corruption in the Palestinian Authority. And they pulled out the good governance playbook, which by that time neoliberalism had evolved into. You had earlier neoliberalism, which was talking about structural justice. Then you had later new institutional economics, talking about the need for institutions, transparency, accountability. The whole good governance, sort of a very utopian understanding of how, how markets work and how, how, how things should be arranged and governed and oversight, etc. And they said the problem is that the Palestinian Authority needs reform. And uh, the donors became fixated with the good governance. And this is the reform process from 2000 to 2004. And donors went agenda by agenda down almost every aspect of the Palestinian governance re regime to try and restructure the thing. Fundamentally restructuring it around <coughs> what? It was around disentangling Arafat's control from the apparatus of the Palestinian Authority. Here is the irony. Arafat was the only person able to create the Palestinian Authority under those political conditions. It was considered treason when he did it. And he had to reverse steps and say, look, trust me, use my charisma, we've got this, it's not just a surrender, we're, we're, we're okay, I'm here. What happened was they pulled the good governance agenda, said he's corrupt, used the reform card on everything from creating a prime minister's position 
to having him disclose all forms of uh, in all the investments, to changing the basic law to make sure that free trade is a part of the Palestinian, to have the IMF audit almost every section of, the, uh, of government. They cleaned the Palestinian Authority's clock and they ensured that Arafat would be isolated from the institution and the apparatus that only he could create. And once he created, once he agreed to all those reforms, then he died. Okay? And that's a key, key time frame of what happened there. Okay? George Bush gave the green light to the political elimination of Arafat in 2002 when he said, we have to have new leaders. The Palestinians have to come out with new leaders. He made a famous speech on the White House lawn. But the World Bank and the IMF did the institutional and economic uh, work of killing Arafat institutionally. And once he did that, and ironically, him doing that is very important, actually, because it laid a path for the future succession after him that there wouldn't be a fight over how, cons how the future movement of w w would operate. Then he died under mysterious conditions. Okay, so uh, th this is also, we have five minutes to go, okay, <laughs> so, so this is, uh, I think, one of the most important, amongst one of the important conclusions of this thing. Now, then of course, after having promoted democracy and the good governance regime, then what did they do? Everything was based on theory for, for them. Then when they, they thought, they, they supported elections for the new successor of the Palestinian Authority. And when the elections came up, and when Hamas won, they throw the whole, whole good governance book out the window. They went back to the exact same things that they claimed they what, 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 what were wrong with the Arafat regime. Namely, that he controlled direct finances. They created entire, it wasn't an institution that they were supporting, they created direct funds to the presidency, okay? Because the Minister of Finance from Hamas, who would have come into power, would have now controlled their good governance regime or institution, okay? And this started, obviously, a, a very dangerous dynamic because what it leads to is the creation of two different sets of institutions, two different sets of political legitimacy over two different sets of geographical territories with two different sets of tactics and strategy about what Palestinian liberation takes place, the non-recognition of Palestinian democratic practice leads to, and, and donor, donor boycotting of, of, of the results of that election leads to fundamentally what can't be described any other way, in my opinion, as a form of divide and rule, creating two different sets of institutions, and that's what remains to, 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 to today. Finally, not after, in addition to preparing what is now should be common understanding that a coup against the American, against the, the attempted coup against the Hamas government, look at David Rose's article in Vanity Fair from 2008, where he has quotations from the United States uh, chief Middle East uh, uh, under Cheney policy advisor, basically saying, it wasn't a coup against Fatah, it was a coup against Hamas that, that was prevented, okay? After that failed, then they, 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 they began to focus and do the state building in the West Bank. And this is where you had uh, the real neoliberal policies which had been created under Arafat and then under the reform period uh, really begin to take off because now you had political conditions where it could. And the World Bank more than doubled the amount of funding that was coming in for half the political territory that it was supposed to go to. And this is what created the institutional division between the two. Now, I want to wrap this up because we've been going on for a long time and said a lot of big things. Um, but uh, obviously, the results of this state building, a big part of it has to do with basically renegotiating the division of the pie inside the West Bank amongst the benefactors to reconsolidate the Palestinian Authority and its social basis after the death of Arafat and after the, the loss of the elections and the collapse, the victory of Hamas, so renegotiating the political settlement inside the West Bank and having that money come in 
And that led to some form of the acceleration of the dynamics, the kind of corrupt capitalist dynamics that I described earlier, that taking off. Informed, informed, so we have uh, you know, uh, the um, overall debt climbing from 1.63 billion in 2007 to 5.8 billion. You have consume, co consumptive debt increasing 890%. You know, nothing productive about this debt, but all of this is in some larger framework of trying to understand a, a, a carrot and stick policy between Gaza and the West Bank. And all it did was it created even more explosive conditions in the West Bank today. It didn't solve anything. You just got uh, uh, the destruction of, not just, I don't want to minimize or simplify, but you got another intifada coming out of it and no, no, no major political solution. So to bring things back, basically, what, what, what I try to end with is that, I try to argue is that this idea that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is between Israelis and Palestinians and, is uh, generationally long and historically or religiously rooted is, uh, is false. At this stage, international donors and their, their role here is constitutive of the conflict. They cannot play as though are, they are biased outsiders. They play key roles in what happens today, in, what things that mean, in, in relation to what it means for Palestinian democracy, Palestinian institutional building, and certainly Palestinian rights. And, and, and that needs to not just be interrogated, but I would also argue it needs to be held accountable. And, uh, and, but first, part of doing that is actually learning about it and developing a, a real sense of understanding of the complexity of this. Because also what happens in Palestine is not unique, but at the same time, what happens here is particularly la laboratorial because you have you almost unique conditions here that don't exist anywhere else. So I'll, I'll stop there because I said a lot, but uh, I hope I opened some interesting questions. Thank you. Thank you.